You're listening to the micro version of the Savage Love Cast at savage.love. If you're stuck in a relationship quandary, or if you're looking for sexual harmony, well, there's nothing you can't ask on the Savage Love Cast. I am a man of my word. A listener DM'd me on Instagram. A couple of weeks back with a very specific request, you know, Instagram, the completely unproblematic social media platform that everyone loves. Just kidding. Mark Zuckerberg was destroying democracy before destroying democracy was cool. Facebook was designed to turn your parents into raving right-wing lunatics. Instagram was designed to make your nieces and daughters and little sisters miserable and depressed. But compared to Twitter these days under Elon Musk, Meta right now under Mark Zuckerberg is a paradise. Anyway, a listener asked, hey, Dan, so interested in your thoughts on the Susanna Gibson video leak. Will you discuss on your next podcast? And I wrote back and said, yes, yes, I would. I would be discussing Susanna Gibson on my next podcast. But then Lauren Boebert went to third base with a Democrat during a performance of Beetlejuice, as one does. And Gibson got bumped for Boebert. But I am a man of my word. And I am late to the Gibson discourse because of the Bobert bombshell, but I wanted to get to it in case you missed it. Gibson is a nurse practitioner who's running for an open seat in the Virginia House of Delegates. She got the Democratic nomination earlier this year, and the pro-choice Dem Richmond resident is facing off against a forced birth Republican in Virginia's highly contested 37th district. It is a toss-up. Virginia's legislature is evenly divided, so the outcome of this race could determine whether Democrats hold the chamber and will be able to block the efforts of Virginia's Republican governor to further restrict abortion rights. So anyway, about two weeks ago, the Washington Post reported that Gibson and her husband had been making and posting videos on Chatterbait, where they solicited donations from viewers in exchange for performing certain sex acts suggested by viewers. This is not a headline you want to see two months before an election. Virginia Democrat House candidate performed sex acts online with husband for tips. Mr. and Mrs. Gibson had more than 5,000 followers. And the videos, of course, are still out there because the videos are always still out there. And Gibson and her husband did not have a reasonable expectation of privacy. So, yeah. Everyone else beat me to the Gibson story. I basically agree with what Mike Pesca had to say about this scandal on the gist last week. It really does show exceptionally poor judgment to think not that she should do it, that that she would have been on Chatterbait and gotten money, but that she should run for office and either expect or hope that it wouldn't surface. I mean, a lot of times there's this big push to have regular people run for office, which is great, which is why we have elective office and we live in a representative democracy so that regular people represent other people. But part of this calculation, you always hear, and I've heard it when I've interviewed people who run for office, is why not me? Yeah, why not me? You're a nurse. You care about this district. You have strong family. Why not? Because of the sex tapes. That's why. Because of the sex tapes. And as soon as someone said, because of the sex tapes, and she didn't listen, or if she never thought, oh, because of the sex tapes, it's kind of a disqualifier. It shows poor judgment to run for office with this stuff out there, to not get in front of it somehow, to be blindsided by it like this. Look, no one wants to live in a world more than I do where sex work is legal and sex work isn't stigmatized. And I want to live in a world where what happens on the internet, sex tapes included, stays on the internet. I want to live in a world where people meet and flirt, swap pics and videos and fuck online. And you know what? I already live in that world. And so do you. People meet online, flirt, swap pics and videos. Hell, the federal government encouraged all of us to take up fucking online during the COVID pandemic and then encouraged gay men to take it back online during the monkeypox outbreak. So of course I don't think someone fucking online for free, for an audience of one, or a paying audience of thousands should be disqualified from public office. But we don't live in that world yet. And these are perilous times, and a lot hangs in the balance. So probably best at this moment not to run for office if there are videos of you on the internet having what must be said, having the kind of sex social conservatives generally think we all should be having. 
one man, one woman, one wedding, one internet connection for life. Where I depart from Mike's position, I kind of think this might be a good thing in the long run, not great for Gibson or her family or political aspirations or the fate of our democracy potentially, but each scandal like this moves us a little closer to a time when it won't matter. Not so long ago, people used to lose jobs and Supreme Court appointments because it came out that they'd maybe once ever smoked pot. No more. Now everyone thinks you're a fucking weirdo if you haven't smoked pot. Douglas Ginsburg nominated to the Supreme Court by Ronald Reagan in 1987 and had to withdraw his nomination after a photo was discovered that seemed to show him maybe smoking what could have looked like a joint. Ginsburg helped get us where we are now on pot. Derailed his nomination, that photograph, but moved the needle. Susanna Gibson, she's not going to get us there. Whether you define there as the world I want to live in, or if she stays in the race, you define there as a Democratic majority in the Virginia House of Delegates. But just as each political scandal about pot that ruined careers wound up in the end kind of normalizing pot use because everybody, for the most part, had used pot at some point, each scandal like this one, and there have been others, and with everyone using the internet the way everyone does now, there will be more, lots more. Each scandal like this helps to normalize what is, when you think about it for a second, already normal. Fucking around on the internet. Everybody does it. But right now, if Susanna Gibson wants to help move us all a little closer to that Democratic majority in the Virginia House of Delegates, she should drop out of the race. She shouldn't have to, and a decade or two from now, she wouldn't have to. But right now, she should. All right, Minneapolis, Sacramento, and Reno, the Hump Film Festival is coming to a theater in you. You can stream Hump online at home, of course, but there is nothing like seeing Hump in a theater with a live audience. Go watch porn the way your grandparents used to, sitting next to strangers in the dark. To get tickets to a screening in a theater near you or to find out about your home streaming options, which include this year's lineup and Hump Hardcore, a selection of the best kink films from the first 17 years of Hump. Go to humpfilmfest.com right now. And coming up on today's show, on the micro edition of the Savage Lovecast, tons of your cues, lots of my A's, and on the Magnum, filmmaker Thomas Nagovin joins me. He is the man who was allowed to re-edit the 1979 film Caligula, starring Malcolm McDowell, Helen Mirren, Peter O'Toole, John Gilgood, long considered one of the worst and dirtiest films ever made. How did he do it? Why did he do it? Who let him do it? And when do American audiences get to see it? Find out this week on the Magnum Savage Lovecast. All right, let's get to the show. This episode of the Savage Lovecast is brought to you by Dipsy. Dipsy is an app full of hundreds of short, sexy audio stories designed by women for women. Get an extended 30-day free trial when you go to dipsystories.com slash savage. This episode is brought to you by Helix Sleep, the best mattress for your individualized comfort. Right now, my listeners get 20% off all mattress orders and two free pillows. Go to helixsleep.com slash savage. Savage. This episode of the Lovecast is brought to you by the good folks at Squarespace. They make it easy to build a beautiful website, blog, or online store. Head on over to squarespace.com slash savage for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, use the offer code SAVAGE to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Hey Dan, so I'm a 24-year-old cis female, and I have no idea how to do dirty talk. I don't know how to sext, I don't know how to do it in the moment, and it's really a skill I want to develop, but I really don't know how unless you have a significant other that you're with, and I'm very single, and I don't have anyone I can practice with. It's just something that I'm going to have to learn like in the moment, and quite honestly, I don't know what to say in the moment. I also don't necessarily feel comfortable demeaning myself. I like to play with power play, but like not necessarily encourage for someone to disrespect me i my style i can foresee is just being a little more seductive and i don't really know how to develop that skill mind you i'm also quite young so i don't really know what my fantasies are and i don't really know what i would like done to myself or do to others just yet it kind of makes me sad that when you think about dirty talk or sexting even 
although you admit you do enjoy a little bit of power play, that you imagine you're signing up for degradation, disrespect, and that's not necessarily or shouldn't be the default setting when it comes to dirty talk or sexting. That the If you consent to dirty talk, if you're engaged in dirty talk or sexting, that's not an open invitation to degrade someone. Now, sexual degradation, many people find that really erotic, find it really hot. We have deeply weird, conflicted feelings about sex. And sometimes when we're being sexual, we want to be reminded that we're dirty motherfuckers. And that reminder, which can be framed in a kind of degrading frame or with degrading language, enhances our pleasure. So there's a legitimacy to that kind of dirty talk, degrading dirty talk, but it's not an obligation and it should not be a default setting. Nobody should go from zero to insult sex comic because they're sexting with somebody. That's something you need to check with somebody that you're sexting with about whether it turns them on. You can have an explicit conversation about the kind of dirty talk that turns somebody on. You can also just pick up the cues when you get a little better at it about what, you know, where that person is subtly trying to lead you. And if it's a direction that you would like to go, you can, you know, take little baby steps in dirty talk and wind up in a really hot, sexy, degrading, dirty place or wind up in a place of adoration, affirmation, mutual pleasure, enjoyment that has no, you're a disgusting sex pig, pervert, whatever going on in it or acting as a kind of inflection. Anyway, I have a couple of tech recommendations for you. If you want to practice dirty talk and you don't have a partner, there are AI boyfriends out there. I talked at the top of the show uh, a few months ago about uh, an app called Replica where people create AI boyfriends and partners for themselves. Some of them are dragons. One of the things Replica doesn't allow is that kind of degrading dirty talk that you aren't necessarily interested in or intense degradation dirty talk that you aren't interested in. So it might be a good place because you get like an AI boyfriend and these can become sexing relationships and you can practice with a bot so long as you're comfortable with that kind of data existing about you out there in the world somewhere. And who knows when Elon Musk is going to buy Replica and just dump it all on the internet. So there's always a risk. You also might want to check out an advertiser here on the Lovecast, Dipsy, which creates audio stories for women that are erotic. A lot of people, many people, typically male people, you know, by the time they're 13, 14, 15, 16, they know what turns them on. Maybe through life they explore those themes. You know, whatever it was that was turning them on was 15, they've gone deeper or further or realized other sorts of sexual activities kind of vibe with those bounding turn-ons. But some people grow into their kinks or read about or hear about something and it vibes with something inside themselves that they weren't really even consciously aware was there. But for that to happen, if you're 24 years old and you don't know what turns you on yet, well, whatever turns you on may be buried in there. It's a puddle of gasoline. You just need the match. And the match can be pornography. It can be a dirty story. It can be erotica. It can be something a friend shares with you about a sexual experience that they had, if you have those kinds of friends, and it might ignite something in you. But you have to be open to the matches. You have to be putting yourself out there, putting your ears out there, if you're going to use Dipsy, putting your earbuds in there, and listening to things that maybe, you know, you read the title, you hear what the story is about, you read the synopsis, and you think, ah, I don't know. If it doesn't disgust you, like, listen to it. And you may be surprised at the things that your advanced age, 24, suddenly click for you. Often I have noticed, I've observed, this is anecdote, not data, that men seem often, making generalizations about 3.5 billion people or 4 billion people and 4 billion other people, there will be hundreds of millions of exceptions. Men tend to have a really specific idea of their turn-ons by 15. Women often, women's sexuality either functions differently or the way women are socialized to prioritize other people's feelings and needs can maybe bury what an individual woman's individual turn-ons and desires are under so much social conditioning that there needs to be this active conscious effort to excavate a woman's own desires and interests out from under all of that shit that was heaped up on her from childhood. And one way to excavate your desires out from under all of that shit is exposure. 
friends, dirty stories, friends, you know, their weekend warrior tales, erotica, pornography, and maybe, maybe an AI boyfriend or two. Hi, Dan. I'm in a 30 year relationship. We are poly and there was an infidelity during the pandemic while I was very depressed and it was kept from me for a year and only told to me because of the other person's partner knowing and feeling there was obligation for me to know. How do you forgive that? How do you forgive that kind of betrayal? Well, you decide to forgive it. You do a loss benefit analysis. If I can't forgive this, what then? Then I have to exit the relationship. We have to break up. We're throwing 30 years away. He shouldn't have cheated on you. Even though you're in an openness or poly relationship, he shouldn't have cheated on you during the pandemic at a time that you were depressed. He did. People are human. People fail. People screw up. If you don't want to be in a relationship with someone who has failed you or screwed up, you can't be in a relationship that's gone on for three decades because there will be screw ups and there will be failures and there will be betrayals. And forgiveness is what makes a truly epic multi-decade long-term relationship possible. Can you do it? Can you forgive him this? I don't know, but you'll have to, if you want to remain in this relationship, you will have to dig deep and find it in yourself to forgive him. If you want to remain in this relationship and have it be healthy and relatively happy and fulfilling. There are certainly people who never forgive their partners, who stay in relationships to punish their partners, to eternally retaliate against their partners for whatever betrayal or betrayals they were never able to forgive or get past. We've all seen those kinds of relationships where one or the other, or sometimes both partners live eternally in a kind of prison doghouse hybrid. You don't want to be in that kind of relationship. That's hell. People stay in those kinds of relationships often because they feel they have no choice but to stay. If you have a choice to leave, if you can't get past or forgive this, and it sounds like a tautology. How do you forgive this? You forgive it. And you determine whether you can forgive it based on how deep that sense of betrayal goes. And yeah, I don't know, I don't know what to tell you. Do you want to throw 30 years away because he fucked somebody else during the pandemic at a time that you were depressed? Obviously, I'm putting my thumb on the scales by describing it as throwing 30 years away. Do you want to exit this relationship? Has the relationship run its course? If you can't get past this, maybe that's your subconscious telling you you want it out for other reasons and here's your causes belli. If you want to stay, you got to forgive. The only way to stay and be happy instead of stay and be miserable or punishing is to dig deep and forgive the motherfucker already. This episode of The Love Cast is brought to you by Dipsy. Dipsy is an app full of hundreds of short, sexy audio stories designed by women for women. They bring scenarios to life with immersive soundscapes and realistic characters with amazing voices. If you're looking for a way to tap into your erotic imagination without supporting a problematic industry, Dipsy is the way to go. Here's one story that's up in the Rough and Wild series. Tiff bailed on our boxing class, but my mood shifted as soon as I met the instructor. Noah's calm confidence was so infectious, I signed up for a private lesson after my first few classes. Warning, this story will make you want to take up boxing. You can choose from a long list of categories. Her and him, her and her, her and you, trans and non-binary, dirty talk, he doms, British accent, group, toy play, on and on and on it goes. Dipsy has stories for straight and queer listeners, and 56% of stories are voice acted by people of color. New content is released every week, so in between listening to your favorite stories again and again, you can always find something new to explore. They also have soothing sleep stories, wellness sessions, and games you can play with a partner, a sexting tutorial, and tons of other classes and sexy stories that you can read. Let Dipsy be your go-to place to spice up your me time, explore your fantasies, relax and unwind, or heat things up with a partner. For listeners of the show, Dipsy's offering an extended 30-day free trial when you go to dipsystories.com slash savage. That's 30 days of full access for free when you go to D-I-P-S-E-A stories.com slash savage. Dipsystories.com slash savage. Hi, Dan. 
My husband's cousin is getting married next week in Pennsylvania. We're on the East Coast as well, but we don't live in Pennsylvania. So it'll be, you know, a few hours drive. It's a four-day wedding. You know, it's one of those things where there's a ton of events before and after the wedding. And I have two autoimmune conditions that cause chronic pain and fatigue. Uh, I'm in a bad flare-up right now. Unfortunately, my rheumatologist and I just haven't found the right med combination to get the autoimmune disorder that causes me most of my pain, most chronically under control yet. And so the idea right now of God, a four-day wedding with all the events that surround it, it just, it feels, it's too exhausting. That being said, I also want to be there. I want to be there for the events because I like, you know, at least some of his family, <laughs> uh, but also there's pressure. They're this very old school family in a lot of ways. And they seem to think if you can technically make it, you better be there for everything. I think they also just have an old fashioned idea of what sick looks like. You know, if I'm not a hundred percent bed bound, then why aren't you there? Or you don't quote look sick. Like they haven't outrightly said that. And certainly not all of them feel that way, but it genuinely seems like some of them do feel that way. But also, I don't want to push myself past my boundaries, especially when I'm in a really bad effing flare up and I feel like crap. So how do you balance advocating for yourself and saying, these are my boundaries when it comes to a family event and here's what I can do and sort of toe the line on that, but still, you know, be a supportive family member and be game and let them know that you care. This isn't a negotiation you've entered into with your family or his family, your husband's family. Stop negotiating. You have, you say, two autoimmune disorders. You're having a bad flare-up. You are physically incapable of coming to everything that they're asking you to do over a four-day fucking grueling wedding goddamn marathon. Show up for what you can show up for. And if they want to have a problem with that, that's outside of your control. The only thing that you can control is you. And if you're not physically capable of enduring this fucking wedding and jumping through all of these hoops that they've erected that they think family members should have to jump through, okay, well, that's their shit. You don't have to take that shit on. You and your husband just say, if your husband wants to go to all the events, he can go to all the events. If when they ask where you are, she's not well enough to be at everything, but she's coming to the wedding because she really wanted to be here for us. Period. The end. It's not a negotiation. It's not a conversation. Be supportive in the way that you can. And if they decide that's not good enough for them, okay, then you don't have to go to the next fucking cousin's wedding. And my God, people, don't make weddings fucking trials or acid tests around who is or isn't family, who is and isn't meeting up to their what you imagine their obligations might be because they are fucking family. Weddings should be a joy and a pleasure. And weddings are opt-in. You get invitations to weddings. You don't get summons. It's funny how my two favorite things to do at home are kind of polar opposites. I'm talking about sleep and sex. Both go down on my Helix sleep mattress. And do you want to know why me and my husband and his boyfriend and my boyfriend all rave about our Helix sleep and other stuff mattresses? The Helix Sleep lineup offers 20 unique mattresses, including the award-winning Lux Collection, that's ours, the newly released Helix Elite Collection, a mattress designed for big and tall sleepers, and even a mattress made just for kids. To find out which mattress is right for you, take the Helix Sleep Quiz to find your perfect mattress in under two minutes, and your personalized mattress will be shipped straight to your door free of charge. And with their 100 night sleep trial, you can try out your new mattress, see how your body adjusts. And if you decide it's not the best fit for you, you are welcome to return that mattress for a full refund. They offer models with memory foam layers to provide optimal pressure relief if you sleep on your side and models with a more responsive foam to cradle your body for essential support in stomach and back sleeping positions. Plus enhanced cooling features to keep you from overheating at night. And if your spine needs some extra TLC, they got you. Every Helix mattress has a hybrid design that's a combo of individually wrapped steel coils in the base with premium foam layers on top. It is the perfect combination of comfort and support. 
And again, they offer a 100-night trial to try out your new Helix mattress and a 10 to 15-year warranty on your Helix mattress. Right now, Helix is also offering 20% off all mattress orders and two free pillows for my listeners. Just go to helixsleep.com slash savage. Let them know the Lovecast sent you, helixsleep.com slash savage. With Helix, better sleep starts now. Hey, Dan. I am calling on behalf of my friend who is immunocompromised and dating. She still observes a relatively high level of COVID protocol, including wearing masks indoors and trying to meet people and dates outside rather than indoors. She is seeing a guy who she likes and she would like to make out with him. They have not kissed or anything yet. And she's trying to figure out how to have a COVID safety conversation about whether he is testing or whatever else before they kiss so she can feel okay about kissing him and not having too much risk. So I said to think about it like having STI conversations or, you know, even during the AIDS crisis, how people would navigate conversations around protection and safety. But since it's at such an early stage of interaction where you haven't even kissed, I understand her concerns about like ruining the vibe. So if you have any advice about keeping it fun, flirty, sexy, but also talking about whether he has tested recently or anything else. I don't want in any way to diminish the burden that the COVID pandemic has placed, particularly on the shoulders of people who are immunocompromised. But what can you do if you want to date? There's a certain degree of risk that you have to be willing to accept. And COVID is insidious. Even if this guy that she's dating and dating outdoors and hasn't kissed yet, even if he were to test, if they could have a fun and flirty conversation about both of them taking a COVID test before they go in a room on the inside together, which if they're going to date as fall moves into winter, they're eventually going to have to do. If his test is negative and so that they can kiss and they continue to date each other, she's not going to be able to lock him in the basement for the rest of their romantic life. He's going to have to leave her apartment, go to work, take public transportation, maybe get on a flight and potentially expose himself at some point. If no degree of risk of exposure is acceptable to your friend or is a, is a risk that your friend can reasonably take in her immunocompromised state, then she can't date or shouldn't date. But you know, when it came to HIV, if somebody tested negative and you tested negative, some people then would become fluid bonded, not use condoms together. If that person wasn't having sex with anybody else, you were relatively certain that your risk of contracting HIV from them was zero. Somebody can test for COVID and you can feel safe being with them, kissing them, being in the same room with them. But eventually you have to leave that room and their risk of contracting COVID, even if they're not fucking anybody else or kissing anybody else, is as cases we're seeing an uptick in cases and hospitalizations, that risk is still there. And so I guess, unfortunately, and I wish we lived in a different timeline, particularly for the immunocompromised out there, your friend has to decide for herself whether the benefits of sex, companionship, romance, dating are worth risks that can't be eliminated for eventually being exposed to COVID by a romantic partner. She can minimize those risks. They can test every time they get together. She can make it a condition if this person wants to date her that they adopt the same practices around masking that she's adopted to protect her. I don't know how you have a fun and flirty conversation about that though. What we've seen is a lot of people resist masking, even people who should mask, even at a moment like this when it may be reasonable to start masking up again. I've started to mask up again on airplanes and buses and trains. So it's a big, or it will be regarded by many of your friend's potential dates as a big ask. 
And there's no way to wrap that ask up in a package where it seems fun and flirty. It's your friend advocating for her own physical safety. And she's just going to have to do that in a no nonsense and direct way. You guys, guess what I just did? I added some shows to my band's website. True story. And it was a simple task. Why? Because Squarespace. Squarespace is the all-in-one platform for building your brand, growing your business, or reaching an audience. You can sell custom merch and create an easy income stream that engages your audience and spreads the word about you. Design your products, and production, inventory, and shipping are handled for you, saving you time, money, and thus making you VIP. Sell your products in an online store. Whether you sell physical, digital, or service products, Squarespace has the tools you need to start selling online. It's easy to get started with Squarespace. They offer professional website templates with designs for every category and use case. Then you can customize your look, update content, add features to fit your unique needs. You can make any Squarespace template do what you want so your idea, brand, or business stands out online on every device. Head on over to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash savage and use the offer code savage to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. That's squarespace.com slash savage and use the offer code savage. Hi, Dan. I'm calling about how to navigate conversations around being single with my family. So I'm in my mid-30s, straight, cis, female and I was in a relationship for seven years, which ended in a pretty bad way. Now that I'm a year out from that, I'm living in a new city, and I am really enjoying being a conscientious, kind what? <laughs> and the problem is that I don't know how to talk to my parents about this current era of my life. Uh, if I say that I'm not dating anyone, they seem to receive that as being the sort of sad, scarred, I will never find love again sort of narrative. But if I do say that I'm (laughs) dating, there are traditional expectations. And therefore, if I'm not trying to see anyone in a long-term way, then it's being interpreted as, oh, like, you know, don't worry, you'll find someone eventually. And that's, that is not... The case, I am finding plenty <laughs> of exactly what I want right now. So I'm a big fan of the uh, only tell your parents what they need to know and nothing more. But what do I tell them to get out of this like sad spinster narrative? I am very happy being single and flooding it up here. But my parents don't need to know that, you know. But what do I, what do I say? Let your parents say whatever it is your parents need to say to feel like good parents. Your parents aren't saying, don't date a black guy. Your parents aren't saying racist, shitty things to you. Your parents want to see you partnered and settled. It's a reasonable thing, I think, for a parent to want. You know, it shows a couple bias culturally, but all evidence points toward people in long-term relationships, committed relationships, marriages, having better outcomes financially health-wise than people who are single. So it's not unreasonable for your still married parents to wish for you the kind of mutual support that they've been able to give each other and that they wish that for you out loud. You can just let that roll off your slutty ass back right now. They say, are you seeing anyone? And you don't have to say, I'm seeing a lot of ones. You can just say, I'm not really seeing anyone seriously right now. And they can let them wish it for you. Well, I hope the right guy comes along. How hard is it to, if you don't push back against that, if you don't want to argue with that, and it's, I don't think something that you need to argue with, it'll pass more quickly. Say, yeah, maybe someone will come along. Dad, how's the sports games that you watch that you're obsessed with? Like whatever it is that you talk to your parents about when you're not talking to your parents about who you might be dating or not dating. You know, sometimes our parents say things to us out of genuine concern, but also out of some feeling that this is the sort of thing a parent is supposed to say. And those conversations go more quickly and your parents move on to other fucking things to say if you don't argue with those benign parental concerns, affirmations, that kind of encouragement. 
let it wash over you. All right, before we get to this week's listener response calls, I want to share a couple of the comments left on last week's show at savage.love. Says Westview Uggers. For the bi caller, whose bi boyfriend wanted her to put something in his butt and then put it in her mouth, why not have another bi guy fuck her boyfriend? And then, if it feels right, the caller can suck the third's cock. Hmm. If you're going to put a dick in your mouth that was just in someone else's ass, it is not the sense of touch that you want to rely on at a crucial moment like that. But it was the caller's by boyfriend that wanted to eat something out of the caller's ass Westview and not the other way around. And if you read last week's struggle session, you would know that the caller and her boyfriend figured it out. Things were eaten out of butts to find out what things and which butts. Be sure to check out last week's struggle session at savage.love. And now, just one more comment this week. This one from SF Mike 64 It's a longer comment than I would usually read, but I wanted to make sure it reached the caller it was intended for. Not everyone who listens to the show or even calls in and gets advice reads the comments, and I wanted to make sure that this caller, a gay man who's struggling to kick his addiction to meth and learn how to enjoy sex sober, got to hear what SF Mike had to say. So here's SF Mike. Dude, I hear you. I was you 18 years ago. Getting clean from meth was the hardest thing I'd ever done. I took a break, didn't date or have sex, jerked off a lot. Then little by little, I was able, with the help of a good therapist, to get back out into the sexual world. I didn't feel like 12-stepping would work for me, but you may be different. Get out there, meet new people, reconnect with old friends who did not party and apologize to them. Because if you're like me, you blew them off regularly with lame excuses to take drugs and fuck. Don't see people that were your quote unquote party friends. And Dan's suggestion of exercising is probably a good one. You can do this. You can find your way out of addiction. Thank you so much for that comment, SF Mike 64. All right, for more listener comments and more of my responses, check out Struggle Session posted on Thursdays at savage.love, where I respond sometimes at great length to comments, emails, and DMs. It's another perk for my Magnum subs. For all the perks, become a Magnum sub now at savage.love. And now, listener response calls. Dan, France is really fat phobic, and especially Paris. And this woman should definitely leave. Also, Frenchmen are not worth it. So get out of there and go to a place where your body is going to be appreciated. I'm sorry, uh, having lived in Paris for 10 years, and I'm a thin woman, and seeing the standards that women are held to while these trolls wander around, get the hell out of there. Just go find a lovely place to live your life. Hey, this is for the non-binary caller with the family issues. I'm sorry that you're in that situation. I've been there too, and it sucks. I want to share some strategies that have helped me. The first one is I stopped taking the whole situation so personally. Understanding that my family's shortcomings or lack of growth doesn't equal them not caring about me, not loving me, or not wanting me around. Change just takes time, and people are bad at it. The second thing is I caved and bought an iPhone. That group chat was worth it. The third thing is I just accepted the fact that I would be the one to travel to them most of the time. I'm just better at it than they are. Sounds like you are too. It's going to be the price of admission that we have to pay for now. So it's been a couple years. I'm still the black sheep of the family. iPhones and flights are definitely pricey, but the relationship that I have with my family now, not without its issues, but it's strong. They are supportive. They have my back and it is absolutely priceless. Totally worth the investment. Hey, Dan, regarding the discussion you had with your guest about that website or Facebook page, is anyone else dating or sleeping with my boyfriend? That was interesting conversation, but I think there was one thing that was left out of the conversation, which was how fucked up that is. If my girlfriend or boyfriend or fiance posted my face with that question on the internet, which is forever and worldwide, that would be the end of it. I am, by the way, the guy who called in that same episode, wondering about my kids and their friends using the word satisfied. And I got to tell you that Dan Savage telling me to calm the fuck down and calling me dad sent little shivers down my spine all the way to my nethers. 
and we're going to leave it there. Got a question for next week's Lovecast or something to say about something I said on this week's Lovecast? Go to savage.love slash askdan right now while that question is fresh in your mind and record it. Or you can use the voice memo app on your phone and email us your question or your comment to q at savage.love or you can leave us a message at 206-302-2064. The deadline for submitting a film for Hump 2024, my dirty little porn film festival, is just a couple of months away, so now is a great time to get to work on your masterpiece. You've never had to pay to enter your five minute or less film in Hump, and if your film makes it into the festival, you get paid. All the details are at humpfilmfest.com slash submit. Follow me on Instagram and threads at Dan Savage. Follow me on Blue Sky, also at Dan Savage. Follow Thomas Nagovin on Instagram and threads at Thomas Nagovin. Savage Lovecast is produced every week by Nancy Hartunian and me and Nancy and the tech savvy at Risk Youth. We will all be back at you next week with our installment of the Savage Lovecast. Thank you for telling